In this video, I want to go over the difference between the logarithm of x minus 1 as well as 1 minus x. Now, you might be thinking, Mr. McLogan, it's pretty simple. They're just switched around. Um, the difference is right in front of my eyes. Yes, but the difference is really crucial in what these two graphs look like. So what I want to do is work through graphing these two logarithms step by step. So even if you have a minimal understanding of logarithms, you can go ahead and follow along. And then if you do understand logarithms, you're going to make sure you understand this crucial difference. So therefore, you don't make any future mistakes on a homework or a test or a quiz. So let's go in into graphing our first logarithm, which is just going to be log base 2 of x minus 1. Now, the main thing I want students to understand when we're graphing logarithms is to always use transformations. I think it's the easiest thing to do um, for graphing a logarithm is to understand what is the parent function. So let's say this is y equals log base 2 of x. And we need to understand two important characteristics. The first one is my y-intercept of 1 comma 0. And the second one is going to be my vertical asymptote as x is equal to 0. Okay. So when we're applying transformations, we need to make sure we're moving that one x-intercept as well as that vertical asymptote. It, obviously, if we have horizontal shifts, which in this example we do. And the reason why I know that is because I remember my transformations from quadratics. And if you remember, when we first learned about quadratics, we dealt or quadratics with transformations, we looked at an equation like this. This is what we call our vertex form. Remember where h and k represented the vertex. Now, we can use h and k, or we could also use some different letters. We could use c and uh, d, because for transformations of functions, that is something that's a little bit more common. So again, let h and k represent the same thing as c and d, okay? Now, that's for quadratics, and hopefully for students, you remember the transformations because we spent a lot of time on it. And what the cool thing about this is the transformations for all functions are going to be the same. So if I was going to look into my parent function of log of 2 plus x, but I want to use my a, c, and d, it's just going to look like this. My a has to be outside the function. I'm still going to have my log base 2. And then I'm going to have an x minus c inside the function. And then my plus d is going to be on the outside. Now, there's one more thing that I think it's important. And whenever I'm teaching logarithms at the beginning, I always actually like to add in an extra set of parentheses around the c. Because what that is doing is that's telling me what is my horizontal transformation going to be. Remember, x minus c is shifting the graph to the right. And if you look inside this parentheses, this is going to be a positive c. So in this case, you can see I have an x minus 1. But if I put parentheses around that 1, that's telling me my c has a value of 1. That is going to be my shifting my graph one unit to the right. So all I'm simply doing, since that's my only transformation, is I'm simply going to take this graph, shift the x-coordinate one unit to the right, and shift the vertical asymptote one unit to the right. However, as I explained, I want to make sure, guys, that even you just don't take it for my word from it, and if you're still one of those students that gets confused, let's just take a quick trip down memory lane of how to create a table for a function, and let's just verify this is actually going to be shifting one unit to the right, because I think it's just really important to go over. So to understand that, let's to do that first, let's just kind of think about um, understanding our logarithm. When I have log base 2 of x, a lot of times students get confused with logarithms. They, they, they just see the log and it just confuses them. So what I always like to a lot of times um, help students with understanding logarithms is to rewrite it in exponential form. The exponential form would be 2 to the y is equal to x. All right, so you can always think of your base being raised to this power is going to equal that argument of your logarithm. So let's go and look at what are going to be the variations of 2 raised to certain numbers. So if I had 2 raised to the 0, that's equal to 1. If I had 2 raised to 1, that's just equal to 2. If I had 2 raised to the second power, that's going to equal 4. Now, what about going into negative numbers? And if you remember the properties of exponents, when you have a a raised to a negative n, that's equal to 1 over a to the n. So if I go over a to the negative 1, why am I doing a? I mean 2 raised to the negative 1. So 2 raised, uh, let's put it down here, 2 to the negative 1, that is going to equal a positive 1 half, and 2 raised to the negative second is equal to a positive 1 over fourth. The reason why I'm clarifying a positive, because students see a negative and they just like assume that number has to be negative. But here's the thing to understand. The domain of this parent function, ladies and gentlemen, is all positive numbers, right? All positive values are, are what make, are the x values that make up that graph. So when we're trying to graph when we're trying to look at what this graph is going to look like, these x minus 1, what I want to do, if I'm going to create a table of values, is think about 
I'm just gonna have to move it over from here. That's fine, I'll move the other one down, is think about values that inside my argument are going to be the powers of two, all right? So if I create like a little table here of x, y, the first value that I know I can raise two to is going to be one. So what number should I plug in for x that's gonna be a one? Well, if you think about it, if you plug two in for x, two minus one is going to be one. So if I plug that in, two minus one is going to give me one, and two raised to what number gives me one, right? If I, inside that argument, so technically if I have this, let me look at it this way, sorry. If I was gonna look at this y log two of x minus one, if I was to rewrite this in exponential form, two raised to what number is going to equal a x minus one. Now, if I plug two in for x, right, that's gonna give me one. Two raised to what number gives me one? That value is going to be a zero. And then let's look at the next number, it could be two. What number do I need to plug in here to get two? Well, that'd be three, all right? Three minus one is two. Two raised to what number is two? That's gonna be a one. So if I put a three, then that's gonna give me a one. And then let's just do one more. I'm not gonna do the fractions, but um, let's say if I need to get four, then I need to plug a five in, right? Five minus one is four. Two raised to what number is equal to four? That's going to be a two. So at five, I'm going to equal a two. Now, the reason why I'm bringing all this up is if let's just plot these three points. And then you guys can see that the transformation indeed is going to be one unit to the right, even if you're not familiar with transformations. So I have two zero, that's gonna be my X intercept. I have three comma one, so one, two, three comma one right there, and I have five, two, one, two, three, four, five, and let's put a two right there. And then you can see my graph, it's gonna look something like this. And you could use the smaller numbers like going into negative one and negative two, but again, to get those fractions, but that's a lot more difficult to graph, right? That's why it's helpful to understand your transformations that this vertical asymptote, which is at X equals zero, since this whole graph is being shifted over to the right, I can also just include my vertical asymptote being shifted over to the right. All right, now let's go and take a look at this one and I'm gonna need a little bit more space down below. So let's go and see what is the difference over here? Cause they look very similar, right? I mean, X minus one and one minus X, like how different can these graphs be? Well, the difference is actually pretty substantial. All right, and the reason being is because we actually have a new, uh, a new letter to add into our transformations. When we're first learning about quadratics or even learning about transformations, yeah, we look at this, um, we look at these values to be able to understand our transformations. But there's actually another transformation we can include, and that is going to be our value b. So if I was gonna look at my parent graph, I can rewrite this also looking like this, log base two of b times a x minus c, which I have enough room, plus a d. Now, this is usually not what you're going to see on a test. Whenever you're given an equation, it's more likely going to look like this. Y equals A times log base two of BX minus C plus D, okay? This is the form that it's going to be in, but we need to make sure we put it in this format. Now, you might be looking at this problem and say, Ms. McLogan, it's in neither of those forms, right? Um, I don't even understand how to find my A, B, and C. So this is how I want you to approach a problem like this. First, always make sure you put the X first. So that's a negative X and that's a positive one. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'll actually go back to red so we can see this. So I'll do Y equals a log base two of negative X plus one, okay? Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is in this format, right? But again, what I need to be able to do to properly understand the transformations of my B and my C, I need to factor out my B to create that product of parentheses. So what you say, well, what can you factor out? Well, if you see this as a negative one, whatever your coefficient is of your X, factor that out. So when I factor out a negative one, I'm gonna now have an equation that's gonna look like this. Log base two of negative X minus one. Okay, so we know the X minus one, that's gonna be shifting the graph one unit to the right, right? I confirm that. I spent extra time showing you over here that that is shifting one unit over to the right. But what about this negative? What is this going to be doing? Well, it doesn't have to take too long just to go back to what we remember about quadratics, right? What does A do of a quadratic equation? It stretched the graph up and down, right? Stretched or compressed the graph. It also reflected it about the x-axis. Now remember K shifted the graph up or down, okay? So A and K are both outside of that x squared, right? Or outside of my function. Those are what we call vertical transformations where my H or C was my horizontal shift. So if A reflects a graph about the x-axis, which would be a vertical transformation, 
B is, is going to be a reflection about my Y axis, which is a horizontal transformation. And that's very, very important because remember C is also horizontal. Whatever is inside of your function, in this case you can see as the argument of my logarithm, is going to be a horizontal, is going to be a horizontal transformation. So not only do I have a shift one unit to the right, but I also have a reflection about my y-axis. And this is why things are so important. Because ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the domain of your parent function, it's all positive numbers. But if I take this graph and I reflect it about the y-axis, I now have all negative numbers. That's why understanding the difference between these two functions is so critically important. It completely changes your domain. It's not just, oh, my domain shifted one unit to the right, now it's one to infinity compared to zero to infinity. No, no, no. Instead of it being all positive numbers, which it would be here, it's now all negative numbers. Now, we do have a shift. So let's go and take a look at what this graph would be. And again, I'm not gonna verify everything with table. I don't wanna take longer than it needs to for this video. But let's go through our parent function. And I think one thing that's important is we need to understand which transformation do we do first? Do we shift it over to the right first and then reflect it? Or do we reflect it and then shift it? And the answer to that question is you need to make sure you apply your reflection first and then apply your horizontal transformation. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to reflect it about my y-axis. So once I do that, my graph is now going to look like this. Notice that my vertical asymptote has not changed, right? It's still at x equals zero. My vertical asymptote is only going to move if I have a horizontal shift left or right. And that's exactly what I have here. I have a shift one unit to the right. So now my last graph, let's see if I can fit it horizontally all on the same one. So let's move these over. There I go. All right. So now the last thing I need to do is just take this graph and I'm just going to shift it over one unit to the right. So my X intercept, instead of being at negative one comma zero, it's now going to be at zero comma zero. Instead of my vertical asymptote at x equals zero, that is now going to be at x equals negative one. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what your graph is going to be. The domain would be from negative infinity all the way to positive one, trying to get confusing. But again, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress how important it is to make sure when you have a B and a C to factor out that B. So that is the two difference um, between these two equations. Now, if you want more examples of how to graph logarithms or just understanding logarithms in general, then check out the playlist I have for you down below or the next video I have for you here. Cheers.